The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hymn 690. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may be continually given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading today is from Isaiah. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, <clears throat> shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. 
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 23 and will be said in unison. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading for today is from Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have all been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to the slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and throw him out into the outer darkness, where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you know the 23rd Psalm is the most requested psalm at funerals? I think it's been that way forever. I, I've watched uh, old movies, western movies, where they're burying somebody up on Boot Hill, and they say the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. It's one of the ones, you know, we learn it when you learn the Lord's Prayer. I remember, I remember my mom teaching me the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm at the same time. Not this one, this is the modern one. It's not the old, you know, King James Elizabethan one. The Lord, with all of these and thou's, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures and leadeth me beside the still waters. When I was younger and I read this and I knew it, you know, when you're young and you, you, you uh, memorize something, you usually don't think about it. You just say it, it's rote. But when I started to think about it as I said it, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I all thought about it like, the Lord is my shepherd, and so I shouldn't want. It's punitive. I shouldn't want. And, and that was bad. And when I got older, I realized that I had misunderstood this, this line. So I, I'm going to change it. I'm going to paraphrase it now in the way that it's meant. The Lord is my shepherd, and I don't need anything, and I don't want anything. But... The Lord is my shepherd. It's not saying I don't want something because if my Lord is my shepherd. It is because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need and everything that I want. It's living in harmony with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, there's a, the process of of going through scripture and understanding how God is, is repeating God's self over and over again and coming back to what God has already said. And we find that so explicitly in the teaching of Jesus as he repeats things and, and calls the Sadducees and Pharisees and, and the scribes and the people who knew, and that was mostly all the men at least, back into the scriptures as he relates something that he has said. It happens today. It happens in the scriptures today. And it happens to to show that God is repeating again what God has started in creation. If you were in the class downstairs at 9.30, you would know that we, were, we started out with prehistory, God before anything was made, and then creating the cosmos, and then God moving up to today. And the message of God is the same. From before creation all the way into creation and through creation. It's all the same. It's all the same. Like it is in Isaiah. In this portion of Isaiah, he is... 
He is a prophet during the time of the ascension of the Assyrian Empire. I've talked about the Assyrians a lot, right? They are growing, they're getting bigger, and they are conquering the world. They're going to make everything the Assyrian Empire. And God has called the prophet Isaiah and said to him, you've got to go out there and you've got to tell my people that they're going to get trashed. They're going to get overwhelmed by the Assyrian Empire, and I'm not going to stop it. Well, what was going on in Israel that made this, this message so dire and, and the rec recompense so horrible? It was that there was a lot of people, a lot of people in Israel, and they were following God, Yahweh, right? But, but around them, there were all kinds of other people with all kinds of other gods. And as they looked around and came in contact with these other gods, they realized these other gods were much easier to follow than Yahweh. They had fewer rules, and they threw more parties. So they just started, you know, I don't need, I don't need, need to follow him right now. I mean, I'm going to do it later. I'm following this god right now. So all of these Israelites were going out here and following these other gods. Now, this makes a big difference in the life of, of the people of Israel and in God's plan way back in the beginning when God was creating and when God moved to have a people, he picked a people. This is one of the uses of the term scandal of particularity. God picked a particular people. He said, you are my people, my chosen people, and I have a mission for you. I'm going to be closer to you. I'm going to relate to you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to be with you all the time doing stuff. Well, you need me anyway, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Why? What's the mission? So you know me, so you recognize me, so when I'm here, you know exactly who I am and what's going on. And this will be your gift to every generation after you, to teach them how to know me, how to see me and understand me, so that when I come, when I come in the flesh, when I, when I finally arrive, when the Messiah is here, you will recognize him because he is me. You know, remember Jesus saying, remember James came to Jesus and said, when are you going to show us the Father? And he said, well, how can you say, when are you going to show us the Father? Don't you know, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So this mission of, the, of Israel, when God picked them, was to know God and to recognize God and God as Messiah. So now all the people of Israel, or at least a lot of them, are out there following other gods. They're, they're not recognizing God. They couldn't recognize God if God walked up on them on the street because they've got their mind and their heart and their spirit all everybody, everywhere else. So God sends Isaiah, and he says, talk to these people and tell them these things. Now, I have to say there's at least two other groups of, of Israelites. There are these people right here. They're the ones on their knees. They're the ones who are following God and doing what God says, and they don't it's not that they don't care what God says, but if they don't understand it, if it's hard to understand or if it's a tough message, they don't run away from God. They run to God. And they say, I don't understand, but you're God, so I'm going to stay right here, and maybe I'll figure it out, and maybe you'll tell me, but I'm not going anywhere. Where would I go? And they tried to, when they're going to leave Jesus, they said, where would we go? You have the words of life. Where would we go? There's another group. This other group are the people that traditionally and, and, and through time always wanted to acquire power. Power in how they lived their life, whether or not they had a station or not. These are the people who knew God but, but owned God. They had God as, a, as an object and they used God as a tool. And they would say, this is my God. My God does this and my God does that. And you can't do this because my God says so. Use the God to beat the other people. Oh, and of course, for the Israelites, the, the, this would manifest out as saying, my God is for my, for my people, for us. We are the people of God, not you, us. So you might imagine that you have a whole bunch of people over here who have run away from God, and you've got these people who are following God no matter what God says, but you've got these people who are following. They're not going to want to hear what Isaiah has to say. Not only Isaiah calling down condemnation on the people, that may be what they want to hear because they don't want those people worshiping either. But there's something else specific to, day, to today's message in Isaiah that they're not going to want at all. This is in a group of scriptures through the prophet Isaiah that are called the Apocalypse of Isaiah, talking about the end times. 
And we get to this portion of the scripture, and this little section of the scripture right here is called the Messianic Banquet Prophecy. This is the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And so Isaiah starts off by saying, this is God speaking through him, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make a feast for all peoples. And continues, The sheet that spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever, and all faces will do, of the people will turn to him. All, all, all. For these people following God because God is their God. This is not good news. In fact, it's not wanted news at all. In fact, it's not even what God said. In fact, Isaiah is not even a prophet. In fact, I'm going to tell everybody not to follow him because he's saying stuff that's not right. It's not true. You know, the prophets were always hated. Nobody liked the prophets. Well, at least most nobody. Certainly those in power didn't like the prophets because God's word threatened their power. Their power is a consolidation of their will. And what do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Thy will be done. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but thy will be done. Their will is to hold on to God. God's will is for them to hold on to him. So Isaiah says this thing. All the people. One day all of the people will come. And he talks about this end here. This is the Lord whom we have waited. No doubt at all that when Jesus was talking in parables, in this parable today, the wedding banquet parable, the mind of the people listening would go right back to Isaiah. No doubt. We find it hard to believe that that's true because we, don't memor we haven't memorized this. But they would know it, and they would connect the two. This is during a time when, and when Jesus is doing a whole bunch of parables. We've been reading parables for weeks now, right? This is the, a set of parables in Matthew, near the end of his ministry. So he begins to speak, and he says the, wedding, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a king, and he goes to this story. I'm not going to repeat the whole story for you. But you know who the king is invited first? Who is the king invited first? Let's say you're the king. Who are you going to invite first to the wedding banquet for your son? You're going to invite all the people of the right station, of the right rank, of the right ability. So all the rich people, all the people who hold office, all those people are going to come. And they're going to come gladly because this is the king. They're going to be the ones that arrive that know which fork to use. But it says in the story they don't come. Why don't they come? Maybe they don't come for the same reason they were invited. Because they have power. Because they know what's going on. Because they are close to the king. They're the ones who are supporting the king the most. But they're also the ones who are the most full of themselves. And so when they get the invite from the king, they say, I got something else to do. He'll have another party. I'll invite him to mine. He can come to my party. Don't regard the king, regard the self. I want, I need, I have. We know what happens is tragic, and the king responds to that tragic event in a tragic way. And then tells his servants, now, everybody needs to come. I need to have people here, so go out in the street and get everybody, anybody, a bum, someone going through the trash, I don't care who it is, someone clean out the stable, get everybody and bring them in here. So they go do it. They bring the place, and the hall is full of people, and it's great, it's a party, and it's wonderful because it's, it's giving glory to the sun. And the king comes out, and he's walking among the people. Thanks for coming, this is great. And he sees this guy who's not wearing a wedding, wedding robe. And he walks up to him. Now notice in the scripture what he says. He doesn't walk up to him and say, get out of here, you're a bum, what are you doing? He walks up and says, friend? Friend? How'd you get in here without a robe? Because there must be a reason, right? There must be a reason why he's there without a wedding robe. Now, your mind's probably going right now to say, wait, if he was the guy mucking out the stall or going through the trash can, I doubt he's got a wedding, wedding robe in his back pocket. But back then was just like today, only more. So think of a wedding today. In a wedding today, you have the wedding and the bridesmaids' dresses all match, and they match in some way the, the bride's dress, and the groomsmen all have a boutonniere the same color as the bride's dress, and when you go to the reception, it's all d done up in the same color as that, that team, and the, and the cake comes, and it's all decorated with the same color again. We match everything because we're bringing glory and bringing everything into a, a, a circle, connecting everything together. 
Well, it was the same back here. So th th they were so intense on this thing that those who could, those who had power, those who had money, like the king, when you arrived, no matter what you're wearing, when you arrived back there at the vesting room, they would give you a robe. A robe that specifically matched the decoration of the, of the wedding party. So can you imagine coming out and looking down at the, at, the womb, at the room with all the people in it that have come to your wedding and they're all wearing the same beautiful gold robe with a big red sash over it that matches all of the decorations around the room. It's glorious. So he walks up to the man and he says, why don't you have a robe? There is a really good reason why. You know what it is, right? They were all out when I got here. They weren't anymore. I have no doubt that if that was the case, the king would say, it's okay then. It's all right. Let's get you something else to wear at least. But he was speechless. He didn't say a word. Why? Because he couldn't. He couldn't blame somebody else. There was no good answer. The answer is that he didn't want a robe. He walked right on by the vesting hall. He may have taken the robe because they made him, and then he threw it on a chair on the way by. Did not want to wear the robe and got into the place. So now he's in there doing his own thing, eating the hors d'oeuvres and drinking the wine. And the, and the king looks at him and says, what are you doing here without the robe on? Nothing. He throws him out. And he says he's thrown out of the outer darkness. Now this is important when Jesus says this because the Jewish people at this time used this phrase, outer darkness, when they were talking about Gehenna. Gehenna is the place of the damned, basically hell. So he's thrown out into hell where there's weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And then he finishes up. He says, For many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? Is this not, I've heard people say it's so unfair. God calls everybody, and they're all there, and then he says, I want you and you. The rest of you can go. Well, before we get there, let's do the robe. What is the robe? The robe, of course, in the parable means something. We know what it is. The robe is the righteousness of Christ. The robe is the love of God in the Son. The robe is the light and the love. The robe is the sacrifice. The robe is my knowing and giving my heart and mind over to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. You know, in the baptismal covenant, when we redo, when we have somebody's baptism and we do our own, the questions that are preceded say right to the baptismal candidate, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? This isn't some wacky question from some real far out there evangelical denomination. This is right here for us because it's right there in the scripture. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Prerequisite. That's the robe. So he puts on the robe or he doesn't. Remember the narrow gate? Remember the narrow path? Remember Jesus saying there's one way to come in. Many people will jump over the wall. They'll jump over the wall and get in. But the real way is only one way. And I will know who took the path and the gate. And I will know who jumps over the wall. How will I know? Because they won't be wearing the robe. They're not here for the right reason. They're here for themselves. They're here because everybody's going there. Or they're here because there's power in it. Or there's something else. But there's not a relinquishment of the soul and spirit over to Jesus the Christ. And that's what that means. Many are called, but few are chosen. You can even say all are called. God sends out the message that everybody needs to come. Everybody, everybody. This is the message in Genesis from the very beginning. The message before the creation of the universe. That was God's message that was prepared for all time and space. Come to me. All you are tired and heavy laden and I will refresh you. I will give you hope. I will give you love. I'm here. Recognize me. This, this call goes out to everyone, and everyone comes, or many come. Some ignore the call. Many come, but many who come don't come with the robe. They don't want it. Now, think about this. We've done this maybe in, I don't know, junior high, high school, maybe college. We, are, we have a team. Let's say I'm getting a team together. I'm getting a team to do something. I got, I got 12 people out here. It's my team, but I only need four. And look at the team. The guy on the end, he is the expert. He'd be the best person on my team. He knows everything about what I'm going to do. But he's checking his watch and looking around and playing with the dirt. And 
exacerbating. He doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to go. He's just, I don't know why. He's supposed to. He thinks he does. Right next to him is a guy who doesn't know as much. But man, he's all in. He's anxious. He's leaning forward. He's doing that thing. He wants to go. Who am I going to choose? They're all called here to get on the team. Who am I going to choose? I'd be an idiot to choose the guy on the end. Wouldn't do it. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go. The second guy wants to go. I choose him. I choose him because he has already chosen me. I choose him because he's already committed. I choose him because he put on the robe. Many are called, but few are chosen. Those are those who choose God, who choose the Son. All people are invited. All people are invited. But that does not mean that there is no requisite. It doesn't mean that there's no process. It doesn't mean that there's no requirement. It doesn't. It's not in Scripture anywhere. Nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere does it say that everybody, that there's no requirement to come to God. It's not there. It's not there. How do we live with that? It's a tough thing to live with. Well, we're people of faith, right? We've got the robe on. So Paul talks about it. Paul, he's writing the end of his letter to the, to the Philippians. And as he writes that, he says there are two women, he, he notes them. They're having an argument. It's a big enough argument that they've written him about it. And it's breaking up the church. It's doing something bad. And Paul writes to them and he says, help them. Help them settle this thing. Help them get it in, in, under control. Help them to remember who they are and who Christ is. They may disagree on something. I don't know what it is, the recipe to pot roast or how you change a tire. I don't know. Maybe they'll never agree on that. But, but help them to remember they will agree on one thing, on this. And it's this what holds them together. It's this which is the common, common denominator between them. Bring them back to this place. And he says in this, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the reality of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the forgiveness of your sins. Rejoice in the salvation that you received. Rejoice in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice in the answering of your prayers. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Not made up, not a fiction, but a reality for your life and a gift that I've given you. Paul says rejoice. I say rejoice. Let everyone know it too in your gentleness. Let them see you and understand that it is Christ that you worship that they are called and can be chosen. And then he adds this wonderful little paragraph at the end. When we're called, we feel we're called, we're calling ourselves into this dark place, considering difficult things, and maybe things that don't matter, but we've elevated them to... He says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worth praise, think of these things. Just as a side note, we all know, do you know what all of these things represent, right? Pure, pleasurable, honorable. It's God. Think of God in all things. No matter what it is that we are encountering, think of God in that thing. Think of the joy of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, the call of God, and the promise of God to be with you in the walk. Think of these things and rejoice. Keep on doing the things that you have learned. Be that person. Be filled and not of need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, friendless and needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. For all who serve God in this church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. of our parish family that are traveling this day or this week, we pray for safety for them. We pray for those whom we do not know that are in pain or suffering or who are alone and afraid. Lord, we pray this day for peace in the world. We especially hold up those who are in danger, in conflict. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. We pray for the people of Israel and for the people of Palestine. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most, most merciful Father. Father. In, in your compassion, compassion forgive us our sins, known, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 
The peace of the Lord be always with you. Yes, peace be with you. Yes, peace be with you. Yes, peace be with you. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you today. I know that maybe you had a couple of people stay away because there's no heat in the building. I thought it would be really cold in here. We haven't got the boiler fixed yet, but we're on the cusp. Uh, we're on the cusp. I spoke with, uh, with him last week. One of the things that's held us up uh, for a little bit is that they found out when they started taking things apart that we need to put a liner in our chimney. Uh, it re requires now for code and other things, if you have a chimney of a certain age and a certain construction, you have to have a liner. So we have to put a liner in there, which was a different company than the one that we've got. So we had to get somebody to come out and do an estimate and then uh, tell him to go ahead and do it. So they're putting in a liner and, and continuing on. I'm thinking uh, they got all the permits last week, the end of the week, I'm hoping, and they should begin on that this week. And they should, he said, uh, still said it takes about 10 days. So hopefully Monday, that means we'll have next week to pray for hot weather on Saturday. And it'll be nice, heat our building up like, like we don't like in the summer and then it'll carry us through the Sunday morning service, and all will be well. If you are chilly right now, I, I, the blankets are still in the back. The throws are, the, are still in the back. <laughs> so if you would like a throw, go ahead and grab one. It doesn't matter if you get up, and it's fine. It's great. So pray, pray for a, a speedy continuance of that process as, as it started and keeps on going so we can get the, uh, the heat on in here before it gets any, any colder. So there's a, a few announcements in here. Uh, plug, plug the Wednesday night group that we are doing screw tape letters. We're in uh, four and five. I think we're in six now. Uh, Going to be moving forward from that. It is a wonderful read if you've never read it. Uh, it has so much more to do with us as a person, me, I, uh, than just a letter. Very short. Uh, come and join us and see. We, we meet at seven, just talk. This is the same thing with the, eight, with the Thursday Bible study. And then 7.30, the program goes 7.30 to 8.30. So just jump in. You can jump in and jump out. It's on, it's on Zoom. Look for the, look for the link. Uh, same thing, Bible study. We have finished Tobit. We're done. So we're starting a new book. We have a couple of ideas. People who came last week have ideas of what we want to do. We think we have a, a votes to do that. But if you have an idea and you want to be a part of this group, then jump on this Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to get on and talk, see if there's any, any new ideas for us to undertake. And if not, we will go with, uh, with what the group liked spoke about this last Thursday, and I will announce that then, not now. Brunswick Stew. Jack Reynolds is on Zoom this morning, actually it's afternoon now, that we are making free pots of stew, so it would be great if you could just continue to encourage people to purchase stew, if you could, if you like stew, to sign up uh, to buy that. Um, they started out fast, but they slowed down a little bit in the sales, and always we can There's the, 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 um, the, ban the banners. The boards are up in the back for both purchasing stew and, and serving and, uh, at, at one of the stations. So if you believe that you're going to serve, and you can, then please get on there because that will help Catherine settle down and not worry about not having enough people here. You know, we've all been through that thing in our life where we don't get any help until like the day before the event and then everybody comes and, and, and the week leading up to it is nerve wracking and it's unnecessary. So if you're going to serve, please get on there and let her know so that you're on there. If you can't, if you don't do it today and you need to get on, call the church office and we'll put you on and we'll relate it to Catherine. Christian education. All right, here's, here's a plug. We are doing a, a, a short course in Christianity. We went from prehistory, I said in my sermon, before God created anything. We're in Genesis now. We talked about we're all the way up to when people were made. And I, I want to tell you, I, I think it was universally re, a reality in, in the adult forum that I don't think anybody knew the things that we talked about. Anybody in the adult forum know the stuff that I was telling you? No. Nobody knew what I was saying in the adult forum. Nobody's ever heard this before. And the things that I, have, I was talking about is a translation of the original Hebrew, which changes the story of creation in a good way, in a way that's positive and affirming and, and has a direct impact on who we are as men and women and how we relate to each other and to God. And that happened all this morning. 
just this morning. Yeah, it was exciting, yeah. So please, yes. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, a re it's not a visual, it's a recording. It's going to be on YouTube. So if you're like wondering what, what I'm talking about, get on there and, and hear about it. It's really exciting stuff. So next week, we're going to be going up all the way up uh, through Genesis as far as I can get. Uh, and after that, it's going to start moving a little faster. We're going to get into all kinds of stuff. Um, everything we're doing, like everything we're doing, is looking at God first. God first and then the self. So I'm always looking to God for help, for inspiration, for vision, for understanding. And then I'm looking at myself to understand how I'm responding. I'm not responding and then turning to God. You know, when you do that a lot, the, the answer to that is I respond and then I say I'm sorry. <laughs> it's better to turn to God and then have the positive and affirming effect and then come and make my decision and feel wonderful about it. And live into it and give praise to God. So come join us, 9.30 on Sunday morning, 9.30 to 10.15, we're doing this, and you just come and sit down. We're down in the living room downstairs, so come, come to us. Other announcements? Yes, sir. Did everybody hear that? That is hard to believe. Hanover County, one in, every, one in every seven students is on a food assistance program at the school. When I've been driving the bus, I tell you that there are bus, buses that have to get there early. They'll even send out a, possibly another bus to get the students there early because there are so many students on the bus that are getting breakfast in the school that don't have food at home. So we think that there are donations to MSEF are not a big deal. It's not true. We have people that are, as Will said, suffering in our own area without a problem. I'm going to put in one more plug. Don't give your, sorry, sorry, don't give your food to the food bank downtown. Give it to MSEF. If, we, if we, we did this, if we run out of food in Hanover County at MSEF, let's say we donate five bags of food to the Central Virginia Food Bank, which we do stuff like that. Now we, get, we run out of food and we go down to the Central Virginia Food Bank and we say, we need food, which they can give us, and they do that routinely to food banks around the area. And they say, okay, how many do you need? And we say, five bags of food. And then they'll tell us how much it costs because they make us buy it. We're buying back the food we donated. So take your food to MSEF so we can give it out and not have to spend money to get it and give it out. You don't need to go to the self, uh, Virginia Food Bank. We're doing the same thing. MSF is just doing it in Hanover. Okay, birthdays. It's an exciting day, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> you were going to skate by until she said something. I heard that. I know what. <laughs> All right, tell everybody who you are. When's your birthday? All right, I'm Carol Jones. Uh, tomorrow I'll be. Well, no. <laughs> 87. All right. Way to go. All right. Let's say a, a prayer for Carol. You want to stand or kneel? All right. There you go. Gracious and loving Lord God, we thank you for the gift of life, for the love that you have shown in creation by creating us and for putting us into this, this wonderful world that we might live a life of love and fidelity, of partnership with others, and especially growing in our knowledge and love of you and turning our hearts and minds to our Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made for us and for calling us each by name. This day, Lord, we thank you for the gift of all of our companions, but especially our brother Carol. We thank you for the love that you have shown in creating him and bringing him to this place to be our companion along the way. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to rest within him and upon him, to help him to know always that you are with him, that our Lord Jesus is accompanying him along the way. We ask you to give him wisdom in the ordering of his life and his common life and that of his family, making him strong in faith and witness to your love, that he might help others who are seeking to find you. We ask you to give him peace of mind and heart and patience in all that he does. We ask you to fill him with laughter and with goodwill 
toward others. We ask you to help him to continue to be that strong presence for those in need and that witness to the gospel. And Lord, this day, as we thank you for so much, we thank you that he is here among us, that through his witness of love and fidelity and devotion to you, we would be inspired ourselves in our own life to follow his example and to redouble our efforts to find you and to seek after you. Holy Trinity, we ask your blessing upon him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Happy birthday. Thank you. Anniversaries. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.
Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.